Chapter Two, Part One of The Spring of Joy by Mary Webb. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian. Joy, Part One, The Joy of Motion. My free soul may use her wing, George Herbert. The white grass root only a little blinder than the mole a little less purposeful than the worm goes softly about her dark house cares in the close chambers where no wind comes and sends out her sons with banners when no breeze brushes the grass we can very nearly see the multitudinous upward movement of the blades as they slip into the light in their ardent resurrection when the trees are dumb on summer noons we can almost hear the sap run when no tread of man or beast disturbs the silence we are haunted by the footsteps of the dust of all those atoms that move invisibly and mysteriously to fresh unions for the building of hills and the hollowing of valleys on such a day all the ripples of motion are in full flow the tide of growth is coming in all green things and flowers hold out their arms to the sun in autumn the tide ebbs leaf and petal look down to the soil whence they came as if they heard a call and longed to go back and intermingle with their kin softly the petal flings herself down and the leaf is not long in following they go not to death but to a new incarnation among the unseen company that moves in silence busier than a hive creating daily a wonder greater than any myth the world around us with its mutable grace the story of any flower is not one of stillness but of faint gradations of movement that we cannot see the widening and lengthening of petals the furling and unfurling of leaves are too gentle for our uneducated eyes the white convolvulus that flowers only for a day meets the early light folded as if with careful fingers and dusk finds it folded in almost the same way you would think that the stillness had never been broken yet between dawn and twilight the flower's life work has been completed in one series of smooth delicate motions the hour of the pointed bud has been followed by hours of change until the time of the open blossom and the feeding bee and even in that triumphant moment a faint tremor shook the spread corolla and the final silent furling had begun during the whole drama the flower has seemed stationary like many spirits that grow from sheath to bud open golden treasure and close again before our eyes and we never see watch a bank of periwinkle on an early summer morning the fresh blue flowers are poised high on delicate stalks and seem aloof from the leaves absolute stillness broods over them no tremor is discernible in leaf or petal the wide blue flowers gaze up intently into the wide blue sky suddenly without any breath of wind without so much stir as a passing gnat makes one flower has left her stem no decay touched her it was just that in her gentle progressive existence the time for erect receiving was over some faint vibration told her that the moment had come for her to leave off gazing stilly at the sky and so in silence and beauty with soft precipitation she buried her face in the enfolding evergreen leaves this pale shadow of a gesture is as lovely as inevitable as the flight of wild swans beating up the sky in a glade carpeted with wood sorrel just before rain you will be aware of something going on down among the frail companies of leaves returning after an absence of half an hour you will see a difference in the look of every plant each triplet of leaflets has softly crinkled towards the stalk umbrella wise and in another half hour 
they will be all tightly clasped round it. It is startling to see such steady purpose in so small a plant. Evening after evening in the summer I have gone to see the white clover fall asleep in the meadows. Kneeling and looking very closely, as the dew begins to gather, one sees a slight change in the leaves. All round the green is paler than by day, when the dark upper surfaces of the leaves are flat beneath the flowers, because the pale undersides are now visible. As the light fails, the two lower leaves on each stalk gently approach one another, like little hands that were going to clap, but thought better of it and at last lie folded quietly, as if for prayer. Then the upper leaf droops, as a child's face might, until it rests on the others. Everywhere in the dusk the white clover leaves are sleeping in an attitude of worship. Those who are early enough may see them wake and rise in the morning, multitudes moving in slow, unfaltering unity. Unlike the clover, the wood sorrel and the ivy leaf toad flax move with sudden violence. The capsule of wood sorrel opens with a jerk, flinging the seeds a long way in a seemingly erratic manner. The toad flax gives an impression of deliberate thought by the way its seed vessel turns round on the stalk, seeking a suitable crevice on the wall where it grows, and then dropping the seeds in. It is difficult to distinguish the separate movements because the flowers are small and crowded, and do not ripen altogether. The thought of this underlying agitation gives mystery to the more perceptible motions caused by the elements. One of the most captivating of these is the ripple of corn. It is so swift, so elusive, that the eye cannot follow it. It is a sea dream to stand on a little hill and watch the whole countryside in delicious motion, furrowed by the invisible racing shallops of the breezes. The waves wash and break upon the flowery hedges and the remote horizon, and seem ready to submerge everything in their foamless flood. All solid things are made less solid by motion, so grass looks liquid. Trees have an aerial magic when the wind is in them. In summer, the willows stroke the smooth water with their long fingers. The supple branches droop till they dip in the stream, and as they sway, every thin leaf is followed by a vanishing hollow. One of the daintiest joys of spring is the falling of soft rain among blossoms. The shining and apparently weightless drops come pattering into the may tree with a sound of soft laughter. One alights on a white petal with a little inaudible tap. Then petal and raindrop fall together down the steep of green and white, accompanied by troops of other petals, each with her attendant drop and her passing breath of scent. The leaves sit still and laugh, for they know that their time has not come, and the drops slide off shamefacedly and go elsewhere. The young buds laugh in their high places, strong in their immaturity, and all day the rain laughs among the thin curved petals, till the descending drops are like silver wires from the treetop to the grass, and the petals slip down them like white beads. How different from the spring lyric is the epic of autumn, a west wind in the wood. The leaves have lost their individuality like a multitude of people on some calamitous day. Wild and reckless companies fly down the rides, beech and hornbeam, elm, ash and sycamore, in strangely assorted crowds, no longer in demure families, each on its own tree. The sound of their hurrying feet comes near, then with wild unreason they turn, desperately flying from the invisible, before the old west wind that blows from the sunset, the wise wind that knew the Atlantic before a ship was on it, the strong wind that maddens the seahorses. It is no wonder that the leaves are afraid. The very trees are bending double before it, groaning in the agony of their defiance. 
the lithe little birches sweep to earth in an ecstasy of surrender the fir trees lash themselves the saplings have learnt obedience their slender elasticity is at the wind's will only the stiff old oaks and elms refuse to yield and ominous crashes tell of their struggle the live creatures of the wood have hidden from the tumult the most living things in the place are the leaves with their scurrying feet and their complaining whispering voices they are like an elfin nation a lost tribe a defeated army that has forgotten discipline the sight and the sound of this world-old conflict brings the same strong exhilaration as music does when it quickens and deepens to a climax what new and romantic discoveries await the explorer in the pilgrimages of animals mysterious journeyings of fox badger weasel and rat the nomadism of frogs and eels migrations of those water swallows the trout ocean wanderings of the oleander hawk moth who for all her frailty will venture hundreds of miles from land these movements of which we know so little are not mere restlessness but planned and ordered comings and goings we often have one glimpse of them a weasel runs across a lane from spinney to spinney a water rat scurries past upon an unknown errand a rabbit comes up from his hole upon pressing business and scampers off into obscurity or a shy little field mouse creeps from her nest and goes back in a flurry most of us have come to be content with this for not many have the unique qualities necessary for watching the free and secret lives of wild creatures it is even more difficult to be intimate with birds for with a flash of wings they are gone in an instant beyond all clues with migratory birds especially mystery is the chief part of the story all summer you watch a pair of swallows you seem to be getting to know them to be nearer their secret then a day comes when the aspens are beginning to be flecked with gold long sprays of yellow tansy sweep the water and in the hearts of the fruited elder bushes are faint twitterings and gentle flutterings looking down into the golden tints of stream you see far within it the shadows of your swallows remote and vague as if the mist of distance had already descended between you and them and you know that soon they will be only birds of memory mere flashes of the past instead of the intimate little friends of your summer days you can never know to what sun-baked cornice what warm blue pool or purple fruited tree they went on those swift wings of theirs the passage of two birds across the sky appeals indescribably to the imagination they come from the farthest horizon flying swiftly high in the blue pursuing their intent way and vanishing you know not whither they go to some far trysting place some nest that is to be in willow or darkling fir some place that their ancestors have known and we are left with a memory of wings dividing the air and a sense of frustration the coming of a dipper upstream is worth watching for all a summer's day suddenly at a far bend in the green dimness of overarching trees there is a flash of white like a fairy shield it comes on steadfastly through shadow and sunlight with a smooth and gliding motion growing larger and larger until the last bright piece of water is traversed on still outspread wings and the bird alights gently on the stone few things are more stimulating than the sight of the forceful wings of large birds cleaving the vagueness of air and making the piled clouds a mere background for their concentrated life the peregrine falcon becalmed in the blue depths cruises across space without a tremor of his wide wings wild geese beat up the sky in a compact wedge primeval force is in their strongly moving wings and their beautiful outstretched necks in their powerful untiring effort and the eager search of their wild hearts for the free spaces they love 
the good fellowship of swift united action the joy of ten thousand that move as one is in the flight of flocks of birds when seagulls flash up from the water with every wing at full stretch there is no deliberation it is as if each bird saw a sweeping arc before it and followed its individual way faithfully the unerring judgment of the grand curve where the wings are so near and yet never collide the speed of the descent of pure poetry in the dipping flight of little birds such as sparrows linnets and tits there is something reminiscent of cup and ball a very light ball in a very large cup the bird sinks in the air and is gently tossed up again dipping continually yet it flies with arrowy speed the enthusiasm of the process the buoyancy of the little thing which can afford to spend so much more strength than it needs make it an incarnation of youth and gaiety in spring the wood pigeon forgets fleet-winged adventure and flutters tethered for he has a treasure then too the greenfinch is overtaken by happy languor and falters in her flight smitten with the april madness bees wings moving give a sense of absolute ease because the energy seems so great in proportion to the frail weight lifted it is restful to watch these creatures so ethereal of body so abundantly gifted with vitality young gnats the daintiest of dancers ephemeral and swift with their tireless measure hive bees standing around their doors on a hot day their thin airy wings flickering fast making a cool stir with their noiseless rhythm even the great door beetles and fluffy bumblebees those angry people of the fields fling their stout bodies through the air with a careless ease that implies immense reserves of power the dragonfly fiery with purposeful energy flashes over the stream in some long quest like palomides those small electric blue insects that make a haze over water meadows in june continue their innumerable dartings briskly in the most swooning heat but there is nothing brisk in the opening and folding of a butterfly's wing they are softly and weightlessly sleepy she comes along the golden day with her faint continual flutter her wings make a gentle vibration in the air from far down the stretches of ripe brown grass meadow you watch her approach and because of her the place becomes elysium the white moth's passing is a lullaby her wings have the elusiveness of dreams as she flickers down the dusk and alights contentedly upon the opening campion movements of which we become conscious through one sense alone brings a strange feeling of secrecy owl's flight and all other motions of which we should know nothing with our eyes shut have an eeriness because of this purposeful quiet it is uncanny that the strength of those swooping wings should be so utterly noiseless in a lightning flash coming in the deep hush after thunder lies terror such unthinkably swift and formless motion instantaneously bridging the abyss of space without a sound is like some fearful portent are our senses undeveloped since the dramas of dawn and moonrise have for us no chorus the wind steals by invisible the stars go through their stately ritual with silent tread weaving their radiant dances to no murmur of music unseen activity hints of imminent ungaged power isaiah's idea of communion with the deity was clothed in terms expressing invisible motion any stir of life is ominous if we cannot see it because we are left uncertain as to the strength behind it rustling in a wood on a moonless night may be caused by slight or overwhelming forces so it is with the wind 
that bodiless voice crying in the great spaces of the air shouting round our roofs and chimneys sighing at our windows yelling above the passion of a storm at sea fluting in the summer treetops it is like a whisper in the night when you cannot tell whether a child or a man is speaking like some creature flapping at our doors in the gloom we never see the gates of its dark house swing open nor watch it fall beyond the waters into its tomb beneath the yellow sunset every day since the earth was the wind has sighed and sung around it gathering up the laughter and tears of all creatures and taking them into its ageless liberty more mysterious than the invisible wind is the wind that is simply felt blowing where there are no trees in which to watch it pressing upon one with tireless invincible force there are few things that bring such awe and delight for it is stronger than a thousand strong horses shadowless and secret as a god nature sets her dance to every rhythm from slow undulations to the swift dangerous rushes that bring wild exhilaration the long pendulum swing of trees is restful not in the unambitious manner of quiescence that might mean death nor with a sudden cessation of movement that might mean injury but with the content of a return after swaying out from a fixed place which implies balance and vitality in the same way a poised mind sweeps out to all new ideas but is not torn from its place because of its roots in this world of swinging swaying cleaving fluttering motion what is the part of the man who is obliged to be still it is in his eager mind looking from the drowsy room which is the world of his body into the stirring life outside he who longs for the gay kindliness of comradely exertion can project himself into the glad errantries of nature he can gallop on the wild horses of wave and wind outspanning his team in the caravanserai of night he can pass with the stars on their long marches he can peer through the soil with growing grass and slip in and out of wet spring coverts with nesting birds as the doors into physical busyness are shut more may be opened into the lusty activities of the spirit and through these doors are vistas of fresh joy it overflows the very sills like ground ivy those who have complete bodily freedom will probably never enter fully into the deep happiness brought by waving grass and running water but he who has time and who cares to use his imagination can see in all natural things the bowing down of the creature before the creator perhaps a young larch grows near his window and he loves the strong elastic swing of the branches or he may have a company of lombardy poplars to watch and can see them when he lies awake on a windy night catching the stars in their green meshes with a sweep like that of a butterfly net possibly he can see nothing but sky then he can observe uninterruptedly the speed of grey marsh clouds before their sheepdog the gale the shepherding of white midsummer flocks towards evening the massing of them for thunder the advent of the first star the swimming rose of dawn passing up the sky the sun's progress in lonely majesty through the great hollow heaven of summer will mean more to him than to other people a watcher of the melodic ritual of earth cannot know stagnation of soul his ideas are fresh and vigorous although the healthy quickening of the pulse after exertion the joy of hard work may be denied to a man adventures of the soul are his along the way that no fowl knoweth who can say that such enterprises of an eager spirit may not be nearer to real life the life of the unknown forces that hold the wandering star and guide the travelling moon then are the more comprehensible adventures of the body a gift was given to brother bernard of quinta valle to wit that he fled flying like the swallows End of chapter two part one